Hello everyone and welcome to this It's a webinar. It's my great pleasure to have all of you here. This will be the last webinar of the year, obviously, as we are um, reaching the end of the year. And what better time than now to take a look back to talk about 2020. And we have great guests for that. We have Ali Reza Ziadat of Energen. We have Peter Eulberg of Adblock Analytics and we have Niels Bundy of Edpa, all three members of ITSA. And before you can see them and before um, I ask for a short introduction, I want to quickly introduce the International Token Sanitization Association. So I think the name gives it away. Um, we work towards uh, standards for the global token markets and for that we mainly work on three projects, the ITIN or the International Token Identification Number, um, which allows for clear identification and secure communication um, among the uh, capital markets. Then the ITC, this stands for International Token Classification Framework. Um, this is supposed to provide far more um, and in-depth uh, qualitative data for tokens, for researchers, for investors. And lastly, the token base, um, a token database that combines these, um, the identifier, the qualitative data and also quantitative data from some of our um, partners. And while this all sounds great now, um, I, I have to um, admit not everything is 100% perfect yet, but uh, the next few months will be really exciting because not only will we um, see uh, more of the ITIN and ITC in action, but also the token base. There we are in our, I would say, last steps to really bring it online, the first version. Uh, maybe we can even talk about this later on because Niels and Peter actually are really, really involved in ITSA and helping us push these projects. And now, without further ado, um, let's start into the webinar and welcome our guests. Um, Hi everyone, I, I would say um, before we go through the year in a somewhat chronological order, um, I want the viewers to understand one thing. Um, while we go through it chronologically, this doesn't mean we have to talk about things that happened in um, January, just in this month, and maybe if they, you know, for example, Bitcoin. Um, spoiler alert, we had the halving and now we had the all-time high. So we don't need to talk about Bitcoin three times, we'll just talk about it once, I think. This makes it more concise. And so um, I would say we start from uh, right to bottom left. Sure. Hi, my name is Peter Olberg. I'm CEO and co-founder of AnyBlock Analytics. We are a little startup, th some 30 kilometers next to Frankfurt, Mainz. Uh, we are a blockchain solution provider. So we essentially offer blockchain data and infrastructure. Our SaaS offering comprises AnyBlock Index, which is integrated data. Uh, of some 20 blockchains, I think, in real time, we translate their data and put them into databases for the customers to query. Uh, also, we offer R any block RPC, so that's essentially node as a service and any block alerting. Uh, besides that, we have a department which we call M2M, machine to machine. So uh, we are a um, chain link load operator as well as we are, I think, now running some five or six validator nodes for several proof of authority networks, for example, XDAI or Energy Web Chain. Okay. I would say uh, next goes Niels and then Alireza. Sure, okay. Hi, hi guys, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Niels, um, co-founder of uh, at par we are a young company based in zurich and we operate probably the first decentralized um, securities depository allowing um, customers to issue different um, types of digital securities um, on based on distributed also, ledger technology obviously hi everyone it's ali Reza here i'm a german-based lawyer a partner of Anetten, we are a law firm uh, in Germany, but also in Luxembourg. Uh, we do regulatory work, but we also focus on fintechs. We advise on crypto related matters. And we are also a member of ITSA. And we are very happy to push on ITSA topics and crypto topics also in the next year. Okay, guys. So um, thank you for being with us. And I would say we will uh, just start. And I will go through some month and I think um, we have the uh, first really interesting news in January. So um, several things happened there. For example, we see uh, the Libra Association now DM or Dime, right? Um, a lot of companies dropped and uh, joined over the year. This started in January. Um, the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act comes into effect, which is really interesting. 
Um, but, but I think for me, most exciting, at least from a German standpoint, was that crypto business becomes um, AML relevant and crypto custody becomes a financial a service supervised by the BAFE and the Financial Supervisory Authority. And um, this means that now we have the first, let's say, um, legal framework, especially when it comes to custody to crypto assets. And I think who better to start with that than um, Ali Reza? I think you uh, looked into this topic a lot. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very, very uh, right of you, Stefan. Uh, that's a very interesting development. You mentioned it. Uh, we have this crypto custody service or crypto assets from an AML perspective, which means that it's not just in Germany, but within the European Union that we have now um, from an AML perspective, uh, anti-money laundering perspective, KYC perspective, um, the obliged entities within the anti-money laundering law, uh, which covers now also, for, for example, in Germany, the crypto custody service provider, but also the crypto uh, trading or crypto service providers are now regulated under not just the German regulation, but for AML perspective within the entire European Union. But what is very special in Germany is that we do not only look at the AML requirements, we also have a special so-called banking license or financial service provider license for the crypto custody business. And for everyone who's providing banking service or financial services with crypto assets, that's why we have in the German Banking Act, a definition of crypto assets, which is unique so far <laughs> in the European Union. And uh, yeah, and what we can see through the entire year, the topic crypto custody becomes very big in Germany. And for, for many, not just for small enterprises, but also for exchanges, for, for technological service providers who do provide their services for crypto custody service providers and so on. So this is something which we have witnessed, not just in January, but which goes on till right now and continues probably also in the next year. Exactly. I think this is a really good point because um, it just became relevant in the last days as well when the um, I would say application period uh, ran out for these custodians. I think we can talk about this briefly later on. Um, but uh, for now, I would say let's jump to the next topic. What I want to briefly talk about is actually um, CBDC or um, uh, central bank uh, digital currencies. And in February, we saw, um, I want to share two news. Uh, first would be Sweden tests the e-corona, which would be a CBDC or something alike. And um, another news, and you, you should really listen for that, uh, BCX flash loan attack. Um, what that is, we will talk about it later on, but you will see from now on DeFi news um, joining more and more because obviously this was a big topic as well. So. What I would be interested, I know you guys have a lot of different perspectives on blockchain. Um, how do you view, um, let's say, Bitcoin um, versus CBDCs? One really having the decentralized idea and um, one being more or less blockchain or DLT forged in as a, a regulatory way as possible. Um, mm -hmm. What do you like and don't like about it? Well, obviously, I think, you know, in, in, in terms of um, digital currencies, um, it's one key aspect to have in, a, in an ecosystem uh, um, uh, where it's not only like currency, but also securities go digital. Um, so from, from that perspective, it's, it's one key element that we need um, a digital currency, being it a central bank issued digital currency or being it a non-central bank, a decentralized um, digital currency. Um, from a technological aspect, obviously, I'm, I'm very uh, much um, interested in what's going on in, in, the, in the decentralized finance world, algorithmic um, stable coins and so on, which is very just technologically interesting. But then um, for our clients, obviously, which come and which do live in the regulated world, having a um, central bank issued digital currency is, is an important element. Um, that is yet still missing, but but we obviously see that the discussion um, is, is progressing uh, also now um, quickly, I think, um, from observing it. And uh, that obviously uh, just drives all the other topics as well around digitization in, in the securities world. So um, I, I do like that the discussion amo among, you know, um, central banks has accelerated in, in that area in that year and, and will definitely even take up more pace in the next year, I think. Okay, thank you. 
Um, then I would say, because the really interesting month come later in the year, let's uh, go further through it. Um, first Bitcoin news I want to share is from March. So in uh, France, uh, Bitcoin is now uh, perceived as digital money, um, which I think is really interesting because you just talked about it. We, we need this um, regulation, legal certainty, but uh, also great to see something that uh, evolved as peer-to-peer -peer without a legal entity issuing and now um, somewhat fitting into this legal framework and we will see uh, many more people using or investing into Bitcoin. Um, furthermore, one really exciting news I found was in South Korea, the KB or Cookman Bank, one of the biggest or the biggest Korean bank, um, started offering crypto custody in March. So this goes to show um, more and more, uh, I would say, uptake and adoption by the traditional financial institutions. And <clears throat> we'll just go on because um, I want to share some more news first. In April, the Libra Association adjusted its white paper, so they um, had some, some changes. I hear they um, might launch somewhat early, maybe next year, we'll see. Um, and Grayscale, a big investor, um, acquires 50% of newly mined Ether. And I, I thought this was really interesting because um, Grayscale is one of the biggest investors in the crypto space. And um, Ethereum is something we want to talk about later as well. Um, but before that, let's talk about Bitcoin, because in May we had the Bitcoin halving. Now, um, Peter, I think uh, if I remember correctly, Bitcoin was um, the, uh, the thing that got you into crypto. Is that correct? Because we talked about it in the past. <coughs> um, correct. Well, maybe that, well, you, you could quickly recap what, what does a halving mean and then also share what you think about Bitcoin in general. I think the halving, I'm not an expert in Bitcoin, but I think the halving means that you only get paid half the amount for mining a block, if I'm correct. Uh, but uh, I don't, I think, I actually think this is non uh, news. This is a technical, okay, nice to note. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest part about crypto, out of my perspective, is it's uh, uh, the biggest part about Bitcoin uh, is that it's the brand leader for crypto. And I think this is the most important thing. I learned that many years ago when we were selling content management systems and in Germany, our customers always wanted a typo three system, which is a specific content management system that is not even that good. Anyways, people knew it and it, it's like the tempo uh, so, uh, synonym uh, for tissues. And I think this is exactly the same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the brand leader and uh, it's not even spe specifically good uh, in its technological implementation, nor in its reach. And it, um, well, it has been there first. I'm not even sure if it's, sure if it's like su really first from the idea, but the first that got mainstream and it's a nice story. Uh, um, Anyways, for, for uh, day to day use, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. So maybe I'm not the right person uh, to ask in this, in this matter. I can tell the story though. I got a friend gave me one Bitcoin uh, and made me install a wallet on my phone. Uh, and he essentially took pretty much all of it from me in the same evening for pay, paying for a beer. So my exposure was brief. Um, I, I was, but this. Uh, made me thinking about the whole uh, decentralization and uh, uh, also includes a really nice story that is uh, what does crypto enable and the thing is and this is something that I really like to explain on the fundamental basis is the internet on, in the internet with computer everything is a copy and Bitcoin was the first technology that enabled me to have something and give it to you and we all agree I don't have it anymore and this story is a beautiful story that's what the brand Bitcoin stands for the the consensus on who has something and who does not uh, and uh, from there on I was very much interested in ethereum and so forth because it's a virtual machine blah 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 uh, but uh, that's what Bitcoin is for me Okay, really interesting. I have to agree. Um, I like the idea of being able to send something digitally and not owning it anymore. So the 
really change of ownership is something I think a problem that existed for a long time and, and now with blockchain is to be solved. Um, and obviously also your, your explanation of the halving was really interesting. Uh, not interesting, correct. Uh, what was interesting about it, sorry, was that um, I think coming closer and closer to this state, a lot of people thought or asked themselves, hey, is this already priced in? Now the miners need more compensation. Will the Bitcoin price just go up uh, the day it happens? Um, I think nothing special happened in the end, but uh, it was really it interesting to see because, really because as you like said, right? In the discussion, it's all about pricing all the time. And, uh, pri uh, and it's not so much about pricing. I, I have a totally different perspective on the matter. Uh, and the, the speculation, especially uh, in, in, for the early people in, uh, uh, in assets and tokens in digital, in crypto, that it's, it's not so much of a business. The newcomers now, they are always coming in via the story about Uh, speculation, prices, and so much. In my company, we don't talk about prices that much. It's actually a nuisance pricing on assets. <laughs> so uh, that also might be a different, or not a very popular perspective. Well, I, I think that the purpose of Bitcoin and what it's built for is as a store of value, gives it the function of, of storing value and the only um, thing that you do on top of that is actually pricing pricing that. So by like design, the function that it has and, and what you can do with it is is limited to, again, storing value and and agree on a price on, on, on what it is worth, right? So there, that's different maybe to Ethereum where the discussions are much more like um, diverse because there is no a whole ecosystem of applications running on top of it, right? And and I just think from the from, from from the design and from the very purpose of what Bitcoin is, um, there there is there is not much more that you can speak of. I I just want to say one thing because it was mentioned before that it that it's not that Bitcoin isn't um, de designed or, or that it's not very good, right? But it, I think it's very good at something um, in storing that value if we see for, for from where it has come, right? I mean over the, those past 10 years, how many, let's say, crises has it actually survived? It's, it's been called that a number of times already. And now um, that's just the economic perspective of it being that there, you know, that, that there is no value in Bitcoins anymore. But I think also from a technological perspective, I'm still amazed by the technology in the sense how resilient it is as a, as a network of, of computers, right? Agreeing, you know, on, on a ledger, on, on again, that you own something or you don't own it anymore. So I think um, as a system um, of connected computers, I, it's actually pretty amazing how it's built. I have to agree. Um, I would say we go on with um, one more news that I have for May, and this is Telegram stopping um, the development of their blockchain system. So I think uh, probably everyone now knows Telegram, uh, even if they are not uh, involved in blockchain at all, um, because the messenger got pretty popular, but the blockchain behind it actually got canceled, which I found really interesting because I recall this was one of the biggest, I think, private sales or ICOs, raising over 1.5 billion, I, I think to recall. So I thought that was crazy and it gets even crazier if you want in June. Um, maybe nothing we have to discuss yet, but I still want to mention it. Um, first, the German stock exchange, Deutsche Börse, lists an ETP in the Xetra market. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so an exchange trade product. And then we have the Wirecard insolvency. I think, uh, or maybe this is a question I would give to the round. Um, uh, Wirecard is probably not connected at all to blockchain and crypto, but I think um, Wirecard being like the German shooting star fintech project um, probably shattered a lot of trust um, of the government, of the BaFin, and now they have to double down and really look closely. Maybe, Alirisa, can, can you talk about it? What, what's your opinion? Um, will startups have it a little harder now? Will the regulations be tougher? Will, will they look closer? What do you think? Uh, you're on mute, I think. I can give you a very interesting fact about uh, Wirecard and how it is related to crypto, actually. Uh, I mean, many people, when, when, I heard, when, when, I, when I heard the news about Wirecard and that everyone trusted on it and they said, okay, with the blockchain or DLT technology, there would be not this matter of trust. It's all, all, it's all right. But what's very funny is that uh, 
the, the, the department who is now in charge at Bafin taking care of the crypto custody license, of the crypto custody license procedure, is exactly the same department that was, was in charge for Wirecard. And the argumentation why this department is in charge for the crypto custody business, for the crypto license, was that they understand the technology behind it because they were dealing with such similar companies like Wirecard and understand how it works <laughs> from behind it. So that's actually very interesting to, to, to look at that. Uh, but coming back to your question, uh, uh, I do not think that it becomes now tougher for fintechs or let's say for startups which are in the crypto or DLT business uh, only because of Wirecard. I think the, the environment itself is de developing. It becomes, the regulation becomes more important. It becomes also more important to look at what the regulator itself is doing and what the auditors are doing. I mean, we have something similar which comes later with the Envion and the audit of Envion, which, which happens also in Switzerland. But uh, the point is that I do not think that uh, this wire card scenario and this wire card, what happened will have a negative effect on the crypto business or the DLT business. Uh, but I believe it is a, is a nice case to look at what we maybe can do better in the future, um, maybe to uh, not trust on intermediaries, uh, trust on uh, the distributed ledger technology itself, which gives us trust in, 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 in the DLT, and, and uh, to, to learn from that. And I think if this is something we can go on, uh, it would be beneficial for everyone. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, other opinions or something to add, maybe from you, Peter, because um, if others don't know it yet, uh, Niels uh, and Adpar are actually located in Switzerland, so uh, they might be less still, affected. We still read newspaper in Switzerland and we know about Wirecard, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was at the, a call uh, from the Wirtschaftsrat uh, last week and the president, Felix Hufeld, uh, was present and talked about, I would say, some 20 topics uh, in three quarters of an hour. And it was from very serious things like um, uh, inflation, European money policy, over to Wirecard. I would say in the last quarter, there was also crypto mentioned quite a bit and it stopped um, in green finance. Uh, and I was uh, really impressed uh, what, first of all, what topics the BaFin covers and uh, how well spoken and how well evaluated uh, the, the pres president made his, his statements. So I think, uh, I, and I, I actually uh, had several touch points with the BaFin over, I would say, the last 10 years, also in banks I used to work in IT for. Um, and I'm quite fond of the BaFin, actually. <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, it's better to have it than not have it. And I'm not sure if there are many faults uh, in respect to the duties of BaFin and Wirecard. Uh, the thing I, I, I'm quite interested in is the role of the um, uh, big four companies in uh, looking into the reporting of large companies. And uh, I think, or my suggestion would be, out of my tiny perspective, uh, would be to make them more accountable, strongly more accountable. Maybe they can then buy insurances and whatnot, I don't care. But uh, for an investor, it's really hard to look behind a balance sheet of a large uh, company. And that's in part what they're getting paid for. Um, but they get paid for by the people who are supposed to be uh, looked into more closely. And I think this is something that's faulty. So I wouldn't look in the direction of the regulator. Um, I would look in the direction of the, I don't know the English word now, Wirtschaftsprüfer. Um, uh, and that's my take on, on this. I can agree with that, um, but <laughs> let's not talk about um, Wirecard too much. What I take away from, from your statement, uh, Peter, is that you think um, while uh, the BaFin probably doesn't want something like this to happen again, um, they seem to be really well informed and, and have good judgment of what yeah. to do and, and don't and seem to overreact. 
Yeah, and something else, I think you can actually talk to them. It's one of the uh, um, least institutions where you can actually talk to them and explain your case. Uh, and actually, I was invited to some workshop where they were asking for a subject matter experts' opinion. Uh, I was not aware that the German Finanzamt did something like that at any time, for example, uh, just to pick another behörde. Uh, so, um, so it's not all bad. I think we can interact with them and that's a great chance for the whole uh, blockchain ecosystem and uh, German oversight. Okay, so let's move on. Um, and now the next two points, we're still in June. Um, the DeFi protocol compound really accelerates. Um, Uh, gets a lot of money and I think now is more or less the time to um, start the initial talk about DeFi because the next news for July would be now 4 billion are locked in DeFi projects and I'll um, give the viewers on the on the screens unfortunately not you a little um, graph so what you can see here um, I'll just explain it quickly in May we had like one around 1 billion dollars locked in June it's more or less the same and then we see really accelerating in July it's already 2 billion, in August it's 4 billion and um, the curve just went on. So um, somewhere around this month DeFi really became a super popular topic. Um, but what exactly is the difference between centralized finance to decentralized finance? I think I'm best to talk about it would be Niels. Maybe you can give a general introduction to DeFi, um, what the status quo is and where we are headed. Sure, happy to do that. Um, so, and and that's always um, you know a, a matter of perspective, right? There are different definitions or different understandings of what DeFi is, right? So, and I kind of take the the role, let's say, of a of, of a hardliner, if you will, um, and and would define you know DeFi as a, a, a market where you don't know whom you actually interact with, right? So that um, puts a lot of um, uh, puts a lot of uh, new assumptions in whatever you're building on such a on such an infrastructure, right? In terms of you, you, you have no, there is no trust um, in your counterpart because you don't know your counterpart, right? There is no trust in a system that helps you recovering funds because there is no such system. It's all uh, open, unregulated, and um, anonymous, right? And I think those are um, the important assumptions beneath, beneath like DeFi really, when we talk of DeFi as, as the DeFi space and it, it defines how it defines new in, in a new way, how you have to build products on, on such an infrastructure. And I, I do agree. I think it's, a, it's amazing what happened in this year uh, in the DeFi space. And if you go even a little bit back more to the beginning of the year, we were just below like 1 billion um, of total value locked in those protocols. And we are now at almost 50 billion, 15 billion, right? So really a lot happened there. And I do see the, the, the main uh, interesting um, developments there, I think, are innovation in the sense that um, existing financial um, instruments have been introduced as new primitives in DeFi. And I look at, you know, um, fixed rate lending. I, I look at um, zero coupon bonds who have been implemented in a truly decentralized way in terms of you, you don't know your counterparts whom you're bor borrowing from. Um, but then also new financial primitives like, and you said it in the beginning, something like flash loans, right? And that's, that's a product, that's an innovation that can only live on an infrastructure like blockchain. And what a flash loan essentially is, um, just to give everyone like, you know, the same understanding is that there is one transaction. What you do with a transaction when you send it to Ethereum, let's say you alter the state, you alter the data on Ethereum, right? Within one transaction. And a flash loan allows you to borrow money within one transaction to do something with that money Uh, within the transaction and to return the money within the transaction. And if any of that fails, um, the entire transaction is reverted, which, which essentially now means you, you can borrow money um, fr from anyone within that one transaction because no one is at, at risk that he loses something. If you wouldn't repay the, the same amount within the same transaction, the transaction is reverted. So I think that's another exciting topic in DeFi, those new financial primitives that we don't that you're actually not able to create in, in, the, in, in the, let's say, the traditional financial world. 
um, fully agreed as well. I, I think we have another interesting DeFi topic, but let's save this for later when it actually happened. And then we will hear from Niels again. Um, what we will continue with for now, um, as uh, still, right, we are in July, um, there's more, I would say, corporate news. Um, Visa said they were open to develop a CBDC, so a um, central bank digital currency, which I think is a pretty strong sign. Um, and we will hear more of the names. Um, Coinbase, one of the largest exchanges, um, 35 million users, uh, is thinking about an IPO, which is really interesting as well, because right, we, we started with Bitcoin with this decentralized space, and now they um, uh, plan an IPO. Um, and then in August, uh, a micro strategy, which some of you might be familiar with, a company buys um, Bitcoin for 250 million US dollars. And actually, I could have added another news where they um, now got a 600 million bond or um, issued a 600 million bond to buy more Bitcoin, um, which seems crazy. But they, they, they doubled down and said, hey, we are still not an investment vehicle because I think only five to 10% or what of their balance sheet is now in Bitcoin and uh, they, they mainly um, do something else. But it's interesting and we have had these news more and more often that, um, for example, also PayPal is now allowing um, trading or at least holding cryptos. This is a November news, but there's a lot of companies moving into this space. Um, and I think now would be the time to talk about it. Uh, and I want to ask you, Ali Reza, because you as a lawyer, I think you have to look at all these different topics. And so while I think maybe decentralized finance might not be the, the topic that's most interested for you, interesting for you, um, I'm, I'm really wondering which type of company, especially here in Germany, is talking to you. So is this like the, the PayPal's or is it custodians? Is it startups? Is it um, traditional financial players? What's what's your perception of the German market? Where are we headed? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, but by nature, I'm a regulatory lawyer, so I'm usually dealing with the German regulator, with BaFin, uh, which does not mean that I'm strictly working only with regulated entities such as banks or investment firms. Um, so what I'm looking at uh, already since 2014, this was the first time when I was dealing with Bitcoin from a legal perspective, uh, is to, to help companies to have a dialogue with the regulator. If they need a license, I will help them to get a license. Uh, but if they need a clearance, like a no action letter to say, okay, you do not need, need a license, but you can do your business, I also help them. And what I also do, I bring together uh, fintechs and regulated entities. In the old days, it was like the, uh, the, 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 the crowd lending platforms together with the banks. Um, so this is also what I'm doing. So uh, I, I'm advising some of the um, most famous crypto exchanges, uh, also uh, US crypto exchanges, which now come to Germany and get the license. But at the same time, I'm looking at small German or even Liechtenstein companies, which want to uh, tokenize an asset, let's say a, a digital collectible and to do something in that direction. But, but looking at, at the, the, the August, uh, uh, at the August um, uh, calendar, what happened to maybe stick more to the calendar, what happened? Uh, yeah, the, the, the crypto exchanges I, I advise and uh, I advise them coming to Germany, getting a license uh, such as uh, Coinbase in the in 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 last days, which is coming to Germany right now. Uh, and, uh, and also others, all the technology providers who, for example, want to do um, uh, want to provide services as like a service provider, which we call outsourcing. And even in that case, you need to talk to the regulator. So it is all somehow in the end uh, related to the regulator in Germany. Yeah, true, especially when it comes to outsourcing as well. So um, interesting to hear. What, what more news do we have? Polkadot launched. Um, we don't have the time to talk about this. I think about, about Polkadot as a great competitor um, to, to Ethereum. Um, we'll see how this goes. Um, also, Consensus acquired Quorum from JP Morgan. Um, JP Morgan, we know in the past had a, um, I would say, a change of heart when it came to Bitcoin and crypto. First, they were really against it. Now they built their own blockchain and now uh, gave it to Consensus. And we had a draft of the German Electronic Securities Act. Um, maybe, Ali Reza, you can quickly also summarize what happened there. What's this um, German Electronic Securities Act? Yeah, I mean, th this is something which is happening for, for a long time, but the first 
real draft of the law, which we have seen was uh, in, in August, um, which means that in Germany, we have a traditional way of dealing with securities, which is the way to say you need a physical document, you need a deed. Uh, and this is something which needs to be replaced if you want to fully uh, trade your securities on the blockchain, so fully digital, and you do not want to have an analogous way, uh, a deed or paper. Um, and this needs to be changed in Germany by changing the law because the law is a little bit old fashioned and still requires the paper, even though nothing really happens anymore by exchanging the deed or exchanging the paper. So this, this we, we worked for a long time on and uh, many associations like the blockchain association and so on, they're all were in favor of changing the law. And this is right now happening. So the first draft came out in August, the second draft just came out yesterday. And we are expecting for the, for the next year, for 2021, to be able in Germany to trade fully on a DLT securities, but also other instruments, financial instruments, and not to need any more to have a paper. All right, thanks, uh, Niels. Um, I hope you can speak to that topic as well uh, compared to Switzerland. Um, where are you guys at now when it comes to financial products traded on a blockchain? Um, is this news for you or uh, is this something you've been doing for a while now? No, I, I um, definitely um, you know, want to say that you know, Germany, just like Switzerland and Liechtenstein are very progressive there. And uh, in Switzerland, we have um, um, passed a law um, also in fall now or, or winter that will um, allow or will introduce a new class of securities, actually, which is uh, uncertificated securities. Um, that are registered on a, on a DLT basis. So it's a DLT register for securities and um, transferring on that DLT um, register, um, you know, a share on that security is, is then considered a, a legal lawful transfer of the rights that are attached to that security, right? Um, as far as uh, I know, um, the law will actually come into force in, in February in Switzerland. So um, we are, you know, as I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, providing services to issue digital securities, which essentially are DLT-based securities. So we are very much looking forward to that um, February date, where, where, where you know we will see it's it'll be a first. We will see new types of securities, right, which are registered by definition on DLT, uh, which can be transferred legally, lawfully on on that DLT. So very exciting times, uh, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And let's go to the September, which is a really exciting month. And um, I think now it's the time to talk about Ethereum because we saw, uh, I think, crypto prices crashed a little over the year. And then in July, August, September, it really began to accelerate again. And so did the gas prices for Ethereum. And maybe, Peter, you can talk a little about that because Ethereum is, I would say, um, maybe even the base layer for a lot of these cool ideas that are built on blockchain because we have all these ERC20 and so on tokens. Um, and, and so rising gas prices can also mean a lot of problems. So maybe you can explain what happened there and also how you guys um, were affected by it. Sure. So in contrast to Bitcoin, Ethereum is actually a network of virtual machines. And that is something that is completely different. It, it abstracts away your computer and even your specific computer so that your code lives on the blockchain. It has an address, it uh, has functions, and if you bring gas, you're allowed to call those functions. And therefore, you can compute, or you can use resources like storage, and you can do stuff, for example, DeFi. And that is way more interesting than just transferring value or storing value. And um, since it's a trustless environment, the blockchain needs to care for itself. And it does it, or the system is programmed the way that it does it by economic incentivization. So there's at least two parties. One is uh, the people who would like to mine blocks and therefore provide for the infrastructure. And they're getting paid for doing so. And then there's the users who would like to uh, use uh, secure infrastructure, trustless, and therefore they are paying uh, to use that infrastructure, pay-per-use model in the means of gas. 
Um, gas is an entity that, that it has a price in Y typically, and it, do, it does get multiplied by the cost of the function you are using. So storage is more expensive than compute, than a simple transfer call, for example. And what happened actually several times this year, around September, gas prices raised, raised by, I think, the factor of 10 roughly. Uh, and that's troublesome because if you're doing services on blockchain, obviously someone is able to use your services and therefore makes a call, maybe pays for it. But you, as you are running those calls, need to pay the gas price. A uh, prime example for this usage is uh, our Chainlink Oracle. And uh, then this creates um, the possibility that uh, you do not get paid enough and therefore need to pay the blockchain more than your customer pays you for your services. And uh, this leads to all sorts of weird things. So one could call it congestion because then uh, people would like to get their transaction through and therefore they pay more gas or they are willing to pay more gas and signaling that and it all ramps up over time. So it, it kind of gets a gas price run uh, to say so. And that's what happened. That's actually, uh, it's still a risk. And that's, it's, it's on the one hand a bug and on the one hand a feature. The feature is necessary to protect the infrastructure from overusage because spamming obviously costs and therefore uh, it's economically not vi uh, viable. Uh, and on the other hand, um, it's a bug because uh, it can do a price hike and it's really hard to calculate. So if I'm a company who would like to offer services on blockchain to customers and need to name a fixed price, uh, that might not be that wise or might not even be possible. So uh, dynamic pricing on infrastructure uh, can be troublesome. Uh, and that's actually what's going on. So there's an argument, for example, in the one direction, um, paying more or asking more for, from the customers or changing the chain. There's cheaper consortium chains, for example, XDAI is one of those chains. So you can offload computing, for example. So there's many means, but in general, that's the phenomenon. Uh, it's here to stay at least uh, until we move, for example, to uh, proof of stake as it's planned with ETH 2.0. Um, yeah, but that's what happened. And that's what's happening again. It will be definitely be happening again. So did you guys come up with a solution then? So do you have a now flexible pricing that um, somewhat ensures you for gas price spikes or uh, are, are you still exposed to, to, to this risk of paying more than you're getting? So and so. So Chainlink as an organization is working on uh, mitigation strategies. Um, uh, how often information is written on the blockchain, who can call for this information and so on. So there's um, um, architectural changes coming. Some of them are already implemented. Um, so the uh, lower depends dependency on price is one thing. Uh, and the other thing is, yes, you have to be a couple of ethers available at all time. So if you're doing serious business and actually there's this concept I would like to mention that's called a gas tank. So it's good to have some gas tank somewhere, especially if you are running transactions for customers, which we don't do because it's regulated, obviously. But anyways, um, so good custody providers, for example, have a gas tank. Uh, so there's always enough uh, ETH for gas to run the transactions. Um, and uh, you are able to then charge the customer who used the gas um, on a pay-per-use basis, say on a monthly basis, for example. Okay, really interesting. Actually, um, Ethereum 2.0 is probably a topic for another webinar um, because a lot of people got really excited about it. I would say, was it in end of November or beginning of December, um, the, the phase zero started. Um, maybe what I can share is, I think a lot of people are really excited about the staking part, but the really huge investors are not. I think they are all really just observant and seeing if everything is going right. Um, but we will see how this turns out. 
I think looking at the time, um, unfortunately, we only have time for two more topics. And um, Niels, I would really like to hear the story because this happened in September as well about um, Uniswap and SushiSwap because this might be something that a lot of people didn't hear of. And I think it goes to show what's possible with blockchain, but also what can happen if you're not prepared or, or not believing in it. So uh, please yeah, take it away. Another exciting DeFi story, right? <laughs> and um, and I think that's another exciting um, development in DeFi. Um, and that's a development of actually we see we see mergers and acquisitions going on in DeFi, which is which is new for the DeFi world. Um, and we see hostile takeovers, right? And so the sushi swap story is a hostile takeover story uh, in in um, in DeFi. And there are other um, stories around mergers and acquisition, which you see around Yarn, for instance, going on right now. But let let's stick to the, the sushi swap story, where you know, very in essence. Um, on Uniswap, which is an exchange um, where you as a liquidity provider um, help the market uh, being being made. So it's an automatic market maker. There is no order book really, but everyone just um, swaps the tokens that they want to sell against uh, uh, the other token, which is in, in a token pair on that market, which means essentially there have to be always tokens from, from, both, from, both, from both types. Uh, so let's say Ether, DAI, um, both tokens have to be available at, at a certain time. So liquidity providers provide these tokens as liquidity and they earn fees on that market, right? Now, uh, for providing a token on Uniswap, you get a, um, another token that, that actually is proof that you provided a liquidity to Uniswap. And that other token, whoever holds that other token, the liquidity um, provider token, whoever holds that token is, is able of withdrawing the, the liquidity that you have provided, right? So what happened now is there are lots of um, liquidity providers, lots of um, tokens issued from, from Uniswap, and then uh, comes um, SushiSwap, which is um, you know just a, a copy in some sense of, of Uniswap. And they promise now um, um, liquidity providers on their market, if they stake their Uniswap tokens, which entitled to liquidity on Uniswap, if they stake them, they will get some reward for that. Now, staking of a token uh, on SushiSwap means you actually give up control over that token and Uni SushiSwap gains control over the Uniswap liquidity token, right? So it was all planned. It was actually publicly announced, you know, what the plan is that they want to onboard as many Uniswap tokens as possible so that they can actually then withdraw the liquidity from Uniswap with those tokens. So everyone was aware of the plan and there was a countdown even, you know, going on for the time when SushiSwap announced they will actually then do the transition, stealing in some sense the liquidity from Uniswap into their own um, exchange now, right? And um, in other words, you can say that's kind of like, you know, a hostile takeover, which we see in the corporate world too, right? And the interesting thing is, um, you know, it, it, everything worked out, right? So um, SushiSwap ended up having a big share of the liquidity after the transition that Uniswap had. Um, SushiSwap is still around. They're still a big exchange, actually, but but Uniswap recovered and and is the biggest um, um, the biggest automated um, uh, exchange again in, in the DeFi protocol. So, you know, I think that's just another um, uh, example of that you that you really have to understand those protocols and and projects on on DeFi to see all all the risks. Uh, but it will play out in front of everyone's eyes. Everyone will see what's happened, and that's then the you know the transparency on on blockchain that you get. Yeah, but I just think it's a really great story. So thank you for sharing, um, because it goes to show how we went from 500 million to 1 billion locked in DeFi um, to one decentralized exchange in another, like stealing um, almost a billion of liquidity, I believe. I think it was seven or 800 million overnight. Mm -hmm. So this is really crazy. Um, I think it just goes to show as well that um, DeFi offers a lot of potential. And I will ask you about this in the closing words, I think, um, but also is something that is not a, uh, completely understood or understood at all yet. And I think it will be really crazy and I'm happy to see what's happening there in 2021. I think last topic of September, because really in September, a lot of stuff happened that we wanted to talk about is um, the markets in crypto assets um, 
proposal for regulation by the European um, Commission. Ali Riza, I, I think this is absolutely your topic. What do you think changed um, when they announced this? What are the effects that you expect this um, proposal for regulation to have? Yeah, so this, this new MICA, the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation, which will uh, come probably in the second quarter 2022 with an 18 month implementation period. So it will be implemented and directly applicable to all European uh, Union member states by, uh, I would say, first, latest, second quarter 2024, um, will bring an, a unified regulation of crypto assets for the entire European Union. It is based on the work which the ESMA, the European Securities Market Authorization, and the EVA, the European Banking Authority, have done in January 2019 on crypto assets. So they have looked into crypto assets and they said, okay, in, in the entire European Union, from the regulation perspective, we do not have a definition of crypto assets. We do not, uh, uh, we do not really regulate crypto assets uh, similar or, or let's say, um, um, unified in, in, within the European Union. Um, uh, and that's why we need regulation, which gives to all European Union member states uh, exact rules how to regulate crypto assets and what not to regulate, what to regulate and how to regulate it. And uh, so this will bring definitely to the European Union guidance on how to regulate crypto assets and the service provider, especially on crypto assets. For example, if you want to uh, issue a crypto assets, do you need a white paper? How should the white paper look like? To whom do you have to show the white paper? Um, uh, and which crypto assets then are allowed to be traded on, a, on an exchange and which exchange is allowed to trade with which crypto assets. So this is something which is now developing in the next two till three years. Um, and uh, it, uh, I mean, some would say, oh, regulation, do we need so much regulation? Is it really necessary? Um, uh, I would say yes, because this is a risk-based approach which we have here, um, which means that we do not regulate everything because the Mika came out within the dig digital, uh, digital package of the European Commission. Uh, which also covers a sandbox model for those businesses which do not need regulation, which they can try to do their business without regulation. Um, but uh, when we look at all the scams and everything which is happening around crypto, I'm talking about those who use, who, 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 yeah, who say they use DLT, but in the end, it's not really DLT what they do. Uh, and they, they really scam the people. For, for such cases, we need regulation, but we also need regulation when you look into professional trading, uh, for example, high frequency trading, exchange trading, et cetera, et cetera. For this kind of, of, of business, we need regulation, which is similar to banking and exchange regulation. And therefore I believe it will bring also a very positive effect, not just for Bitcoin, but for the entire crypto environment. Okay, thank you very much for um, yeah, this assessment. I mostly agree. I think it will be really interesting. Um, we'll see, I, I guess, while it might be a hurdle for some of the startups, I think um, the good ones will uh, get over these. Um, and now hearing what you think about that, about the German regulation and um, legal framework coming more and more together, and also what you mentioned, Niels, um, in Switzerland, I think 2021 is going to be really exciting. I want to super quickly wrap up what we um, have happened in October, November and December, and then I would be happy to hear what you guys think um, we can expect from 2021. So just very quickly, in October, the ECB um, said uh, that they prepare for the digital euro. Um, we will see where this is headed, but this sounds really, really interesting. Um, we also uh, have more and more companies investing um, into uh, not crypto, but blockchain as a whole. For example, Lombard, uh, Odier, a Swiss private bank, um, invests 250 million in a tokenization fintech. So this is really exciting. In November, PayPal opens a crypto platform for US customers. We have um, Grayscale, uh, the largest investors in crypto. They now have over 10 billion in crypto assets and probably today was a great day for them. Um, BlackRock said, their uh, CIO said, Bitcoin is here to stay. Um, and this is a message echoed by a lot of traditional financial institutions now. So I think this idea of mainstream adoption um, gets closer and closer. And also, and Ali Reza, you mentioned that the grandfathering rule deadline ended for German crypto custody license, meaning um, whoever wants to offer crypto custody um, 
in Germany now has to um, have applied uh, by the BaFin or at the BaFin um, with a complete application. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see which custodians, which exchanges will get these licenses uh, in the future. And then obviously um, in December, we had Ethereum 2.0 and just yesterday, we had um, the new all time high for Bitcoin. So I think this is really exciting. Um, I also think it's it's uh, going to be really interesting. I mean, what's going to happen? I was afraid that a lot of um, investors might have a sell order at the position, you know, saying, oh, when we reach the all time high, let's sell because I'm afraid a lot of other people will sell. Um, <laughs> maybe you guys can quickly share your opinion on that. And then I'd be happy to close this webinar. I'm hearing what you think about 2021. Yeah, so I I have three like three topics that um, I I see uh, twenty twenty one will be you know bringing and and um, and those are I mean more DeFi I'm sure DeFi will continue to grow um, in the same pace I guess um, it will bring up new innovation um, uh, new financial primitives which which is exciting um, and then. Um, mainstream adoption of of crypto of, of digital assets in general uh, we see first like funds coming in um, and not only like the big funds but also mainstream adoption in terms of banks offering to their clients um, uh, digital assets as a diversification of their portfolios um, and so it will drive prices obviously and i look at you know specifically bitcoin ether um, which probably you know um, can go up um, much more um, seeing the new volume coming in and finally, uh, the regulation, uh, the regulatory environment that will bring additional certainty into that space, which will, which will also um, drive adoption of digital securities, um, where we see um, securities uh, being digitized um, um, in the next year. So I think those are the three developments that we that we op that we will be observing. Thank you very much. I would say, Peter, you go next. Yeah. I agree with Niels. It has been a strong year for crypto and 2021 will be even stronger. So adoption rate in general will increase. Uh, definitely more DeFi. So the value proposition for DeFi is very strong. Where do you get 4% interest rate? No else. Consistently. And it's not speculation. So you only have systemic risk. That is a super interesting pitch. That's even a pitch German Volksbanken are interested in. What does that mean? So um, the DeFi pitches are very strong in, out of my perspective. And then there's tokenization. I think there will be many, many more tokenization. It's a very easy calculation. Uh, there's lots of liquidity out there. We are still printing money like hell. So uh, this money needs to go places. So we'll take whatever is available, wine bottles, old timers, buildings, you name it, whatever is out there, liquidity is pushing. It's like water. So <laughs> this is, I, I think this is hugely underestimated. And that's actually one of the reasons why I'm also bullish on prices. Uh, so the utility is already there. It has been proven. It is, the system is, resi is resilient. So um, that's why I'm overall bullish. And um, maybe one more term, uh, non-fungible tokens. They, I think there are um, and marketplaces around these, maybe even with institutional investors, bigger names, bigger marketplaces, even in Germany. Yeah, I, I would just continue where you ended, uh, Peter. So uh, non-fungible tokens are also called digital collectibles. They are definitely coming. Uh, this is one thing besides the crypto custody service providers which are coming. I believe that banks and other uh, regulated entities that will also look at this new e e German electronic securities law where we have the re register keeper which is coming. This is a new new yeah new animal in the in a in a crypto economy which is coming definitely. With these two or three things, I strongly believe that the asset management industry will focus right now a lot of investing into crypto but also digitize digitizing their, their their funds because funds you can also start to trade digitally um, and last but not least we should not forget about it i believe that libra or now dm called will move from switzerland to an eu country such as germany maybe um, and then uh, really roll out and go for the license 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I agree. I think it's really interesting. Um, I myself, I don't want to share um, what I think of the next days. I just want to thank you all three, Peter, Niels and Ali Reza for taking your time for joining us. Um, I want to thank everyone who tuned in. Sorry for the technical hiccups. Um, we will continue in 2021, um, both with ITSA, with uh, webinars and with other contents. And I guess I'm going to talk to you guys soon. And uh, in the meantime, I wish everyone a great holidays. Uh, a great start to 2021 uh, stay healthy stay safe uh, have a good time and relax a little and uh, yeah i'm i'm really excited for what is to come in 2021 and i i think we will see how it turns out so thank you everyone and see you soon bye bye